Oh my God, hey, Andrew Lipper. Hello, how are you? It's, I'm very well. It's, it's an extraordinary privilege to get to speak to you here in London. You're here ahead of the European premiere of I Am Harvey Milk. It sounds very fancy, Mickey Joe. It is very exciting to be here in the land of my birth. I should start with that. I was born in Leeds yeah. in 1964. So um, if you're airing this this year, 2024, you will know that if you do maths, that uh, in December I will be 60, and it's amazing to me that's happening, and it's wonderful to be here in London doing the show. I just found this out about you this morning. I was taking a little look. I didn't realize that you were born in the UK. I was to British parents my, and British grandparents, so I'm third generation English, and uh, my parents decided to move to the United States. We moved in 1967, so I was almost three, so... That's why I don't have a, much of a Yorkshire accent. And when I try, uh -huh. my cousins do not like it at <laughs> all. So, ru rubbish, bloody rubbish. That's the best I can do. Listen, I've heard, I've heard worse from many Americans, so <laughs> you're absolutely sure fine. You have. Yeah. Sure you have. Now, I'm Harvey Milk is playing two performances at Cadogan Hall this Sunday. That's October 27th. But I also want to talk about some of the musicals that have brought you here. Uh, now, I'm curious, by your own reckoning, when you encounter particularly musical theater fans, what is it that they most readily associate you with? I mean, the Adams Family is, is the most... Uh, well-known of my musicals and the one, uh, in fact, uh, it gets more uh, licensed productions than any other musical at the moment. Uh, and so it's kind of a blessing and it gets done all over the world in multiple languages. And I've had the opportunity of seeing it, uh, not only just this year here in London at the Palladium uh, with Michelle Visage and Rumi Karamlu, which was just so thrilling, um, but it, in many languages I've been. We saw it in, I've seen it in Japan, I've seen it in uh, Brazil, uh, in Portuguese, I've seen it in Germany. It's uh, really been amazing. So I'd say that and the Wild Party, people often mention the Wild Party. Um, and this, and, and interestingly, I am Harvey Milk, I think. There's a, a number of musical theater fans are very aware of this piece and uh, have either seen a version of it or um, certainly know it from the recording. So it's really gratifying. For me, those are three rather different kinds of shows. Uh, the Wild Party is, uh, you know, the debauched and very um, edgy uh, and uh, very um, aggressive. And uh, The Addams Family is a big entertainment, you know, based on those famous characters. And then I'm Harvey Milk is a, a very a sort of an epic uh, oratorio-like theatrical work that has a orchestra, full, you know, full orchestra and a chorus and. Um, a rather different side of me. So I feel very fortunate that uh, not only that people know the work, but that I get to do different things like those, those kinds of shows. And we've been very lucky to enjoy brilliant productions of many of your shows here in the UK. John and Jen, we had a lovely one a few years ago at Southwark Playhouse. Yes, with Rachel Tucker and Louis Corne, and uh, they filmed it as well. So they did a five camera, with what they call a pro shot, I think. That's available on various uh, streaming platforms. And, uh, and, they, and <laughs> curiously, the people who made the film sent me a box of DVDs. And, I, and it was like, I don't have a DVD player anymore, so I don't have an L I don't have a record player either. Although that I know has come back, a lot of people have uh, turntables, but um, but I didn't. I don't have a DVD player, so I can't even watch my own film. The other forum where we certainly get to hear a lot of your work is in audition rooms, but specifically in drama school audition rooms. And what experience I have had, there is always a lot of Andrew Lipper representation because when you created Pulled for the Adams Family. What you birthed with that, everyone was singing that song, and still does. I have, I have a few, uh, have a, that's a joyful thing to hear, thank you. I, I love that um, young people, I do a lot of teaching, I'll, I'll, I'll come to, I'm a patron of Urdang, um, and so I've taught there uh, several times, and I do a lot of things in the United States and, um, and in some other countries as well, uh, to um, work with actors and singing actors, to, uh, you know, musical theater programs. and. The, there are three or four of my songs that young women uh, just grabbed onto, Pulled being one of them. Can I guess the other three? Oh, sure. There are, th there are three others I would. Well, hmm, there are three or four others, but go ahead. You can pick. So, present my new philosophy. My new philosophy, of course. That's the one I wrote for Kristen Chenoweth, yes. And uh -huh. of, um, maybe I like it this way. That is on the list, yes. Very good. And, oh, those are, the, those are the standout ones to me. I'll let you tell me the rest. Well, well, there's a telephone number flashing at the bottom of your screen if you want to call and vote. Please yeah. call, <laughs> plus four four 
Um, the other two I was thinking was Live Out Loud, which a lot of young girl, girls and young women uh, do uh, from A Little Princess. And uh, the other one is I'm Not Waiting, which I wrote as a, just a standalone thing. And uh, I, I always, I always uh, when I work with young women who sing that song, I, they connect with it so deeply. And it's such a sad song about self-hatred and, you know, sort of codependence. And, and so I, I often mention how it makes me sad a little that these women can really relate to these songs. And I will often ask them. It's a very personal question, obviously, but that's the nature of this kind of work. And I will ask a version of a question, which is, you know, what is it about the song, you know, what is, is that's going on in your life that you're really connecting to this particular thing. So it's uh, wonderful that you mentioned the drama school thing. They have this thing um, in America called the Jimmy Awards. Do you know about this? A good friend of mine, a producer, a friend, goes to it every year and he uh, sends me an email the next day say, telling me the number of Lippa songs that were done in the program. So lots of, lots of big fish. I, lots of big fish right now. Yes, that's true. So I'm always grateful to hear it. Thank you for mentioning it. Speaking of your standalone song catalog, I am a huge fan of the song Marshall Levin. Well, I'll tell you a quick story about how that song came to be. So Steve Sondheim turned 80 in, set in March of uh, 2010. And in the fall of 2009, I got a call from the late Todd Hames, who used to run the roundabout. Um, and he said that Steve had handpicked a group of uh, younger generation songwriters um, and uh, wanted me to write a song for his birthday party that was happening after um, Sondheim on Sondheim opened. So you would go to the Sondheim on Sondheim opening night and then everybody went over to a hotel ballroom and there were 900 people at tables and Paul Gemignani was the music director and a group of people like uh, Christian Anderson Lopez and Bobby Lopez and uh, me and uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda and a number of other, Jeanine uh, Tesori and David Lindsay Abair and we were asked, write a song. I was asked, write a song about Steve. Like anything you wanted to write. I was at the time in a rehearsal in Chicago for our out of town tryout of the Adams Family. And I said, Todd, I am doing a new show out of town and my head is filled with that at the moment and I don't know what I'm gonna write. So can you let me get back to you on this? He said, sure. And about three weeks later, I had the idea and it was, what the song became, which is when I was in 10th grade and I had a crush on this 12th grade boy and he didn't, I don't, you know, I never made my crush, uh, I never said anything about it, but I went over to his house during spring break and um, uh, which happened to be also during the week of Passover and we were both Jewish and so my mother would let me go to this boy's house because they kept kosher as well and so I could eat food there and um, I went over and he said, do you want to listen to records? And I was like, you know, do I? That, that was like an invitation. I thought that was code. And so we went into his bedroom and he turned to me and he said, do you know Sweeney Todd? And I swear, I had never heard of it. It was 1981, so it wasn't that long after the show had premiered. And I, it sounded like a feminine hygiene product. Like I had no idea what Sweeney Todd used Sweeney. That's why I use Sweeney Todd to keep fresh. And so he played, we listened. And in those days, talking about LPs, they were, um, you had the booklet inside that had photos from the production and had all the libretto. And, and it felt like mad, this magical thing. Like I, I had never done that before. I'd never done that before. I didn't know cast recordings were a thing. I didn't know they had booklets and photos. And, and, I, and we listened to it for all four sides of the record, you know, of the two records. We listened to the whole show. And uh, my song, March 11, that I sang at that event was exactly that story about March 11. Like you were the one who introduced me to Sondheim. And like, I didn't know that that, you know, Sonny was gonna be much more important than you were. <laughs> and Steve was so, oh, it was just so wonderful because it happened to be the same night, that birthday party in New York City happened to be the same night that Michelle Obama, then First Lady Michelle Obama, was coming to see the Adams Family with her children and her mother. And so 
it was the choice of seeing American royalty or seeing theater royalty, and I had made the commitment to theater royalty, so I wasn't at the theater that night to greet Michelle Obama. And I did that, not that song, and Steve wrote me the most wonderful note about it, which I have framed with a photo that they took of me singing the song from that evening. And in fact, a few years later, when my publisher published the Andrew Lippa songbook, about 30 songs of mine, I, uh, I got in touch with Steve and I said, look, there, there's so many of your th themes. I, like, I used quite a bit of his music, you know, and turned it upside down you know, and reharmonized things. And I said, it's kind of partly your song, so I want to publish it, but should we publish it together and we'll co-own the song? And he said yes, and I think, and it's the only song I co-own with Stephen Sondheim. So that's my, my little part of, the, of his estate, is, is that I own half of a song. It's very kind of you to mention that song, because I, I, I'm really the only one I know who does it. There may be young men out there doing it, but... I've never seen anybody else do it. Speaking of Sondheim, um, with a way to get us to I Am Harvey Milk, uh, it wasn't really, I guess, until he wrote Roadshow that he was writing overtly gay men and overtly gay love songs. Um, although there were like themes and you could read into things throughout the career. Covert gays in the Sondheim shows. I suppose Bobby yeah. was covertly gay in company. Follies is, is gay without being gay. <laughs> it's gay just because we say so yeah. um that's right and steve uh stayed away from that for some reason and and fosca is sort of gay oh sure. right but n n like in terms of the sort of obsessive and self-hating and the all all of the things that um you read many times about you know particularly gay men of a certain generation i experienced that i was you know went through um, the 70s and the 80s. I was 1984 before I came out, and uh, although I was 21, but it still was, you know, not safe as it were. It wasn't didn't feel like you know it was going to be easy in 1984. Not I wouldn't say I don't know how to describe it. Right? It's not not necessarily easy now, but um, it was 40 years ago. So life is a bit a bit different now. Yes. Which was going to bring me to Harvey Milk. Does this work feel sort of a degree more personal than previous shows? Uh, to, not to a degree. It's vastly more personal than anything else that I had written before. In fact, when it came along in 2011, I was asked to write one song and uh, for the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus, and I convinced them to let me write an entire evening and about Harvey Milk. And um, I, uh, the one thing... Uh, any project that I've taken on, large-scale project that I've taken on, I take on because, in part, I don't know how to do it. And that interests me, that I don't know how to, I don't want to do something I know how to do, because then, where's the fun in that? And second, it has to frighten me in, at some level. And uh, writing about being gay and writing about a gay man um, not from the perspective of, oh, what a hero he was, but he was a gay man who said, you know, it's time for us to say, who, to claim our place and to say who we are and, um, and to come out. And that, I, I had been out for a long time, but like many gay people I know, you're, it's always coming out. Like every day you're, you're coming out. And living in London or New York City, it's a little easier um, I think, than it is where I also live in Columbus, Ohio, which is um, certainly a, a fairly liberal place, but my husband and I will go to a meal and the, you know, the server might say something, you know, he may be not be at the table, and I say, or my husband's joining me, or whatever, and I'm there in central Ohio saying, my husband, and I'm wearing, I'm wearing a ring, and I'm not, uh, I feel no shame, but I do feel a sense of huh, I wonder what's going to happen when I say this. And so my approach to I Am RV Milk in 2011 was solely personal and, uh, and, and was my, uh, felt like my opportunity or at least my first opportunity to express some ideas about the kinds of gay people I would like to see represented in musical language um, rather than what I had seen a lot of were, you know, again, this is not meant to be in any way pejorative, but, you know, there are lots of examples of gay men in 
you know, feathers and, and grand and campy and all of the wonderful things that, that are part of being uh, gay. Not a lot of examples that I could put my finger on in 2011 in the musical theater of gay men or women who were just happened to be gay. Like, like that's, that's who they are. They're gay. And now they're also school teachers or lawyers or politicians or uh, pastry chefs. And there's not a lot of that that I've seen. And so I wanted to both lift up the idea of Har Harvey Milk as a gay hero and as, as who, had, who had done something heroic and who had died senselessly, um, but also to create something that felt like uh, the gay person I was trying to be. And, and so I think that's what really gives it its personal quality. And we, we encounter him at a young age and he has dialogue with his younger self, is that right? It starts, it, yes, it is non-chronological, but I, I like to say it is non-chronological, but it is emotionally chronological. And so it, it's a very curious, it's not a musical, um, and at the same time, it's got a lot, it, you know, a lot of hallmarks of things that I might put in a musical are in it. And there's a disco number in, the, in it, you know, and that's definitely not something you go to the opera house or the concert hall for. It opens with an imagined conversation with his younger self, and, and it is, which is immediately followed by a piece called I Am the Bullet, um, which is sung by the chorus, which is the very end of his life. And it, it is an anthropomorphic idea of giving the bullet um, personality and a life and, an, and, and something to say. What did the bullet, the bullet was the last person who saw, last person, the bullet was last presence, the last thing uh, seeing Harvey Milk before Harvey died. And so it's this supposition of the bullet saying, you know, what did I see? And, and what, did, what, what, what was Harvey thinking when I was passing through his head? And it sounds grim and grisly, but it's actually really, successful and and the piece opens with him and his his childhood self and and second the second piece is his death so the and the audience has always i've seen it done in many places um the audience just they go okay now anything goes like bring it on what's next and they just buy it they buy that it's non-linear and that they're just going to get shown the right next thing, and they 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 go along with it. It's really quite wonderful to watch the audience response. And speaking of sort of coming out journeys as well, I read in another interview you gave about an audience member who was so sort of comforted and inspired by the work that it gave them the courage to make that phone call. Well, the premiere was uh, June 26, 2013, and that was the day that the Supreme Court of the United States struck down the Defense of Marriage Act and Proposition 8, which was a law that was enacted, enacted in November of 2008, prohibiting Californians from getting married, uh, uh, same-sex marriages. So the day we premiered I Am Harvey Milk, suddenly same-sex marriages were deemed legal in the state of California. We premiered it in San Francisco, two blocks from where George Moscone, the mayor, the then mayor, and Harvey Milk had been assassinated. Two days later, uh, uh, after, before our third performance, then Attorney General of the State of California performed the first gay wedding after that landmark Supreme Court ruling uh, with the two, two of the four plaintiffs in that case, a gay, uh, a two women, a gay women couple, uh, whose names I, I'm forgetting at the moment. Um, and that Attorney General's name uh, is Kamala Harris. And uh, the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus sang one of the songs from I'm Harvey Milk called San Francisco on the steps of the City Hall with then Attorney General Kamala Harris performing the first same-sex wedding in California in 2013 uh, since it, it had been outlawed in 2008. I can't think of a more thrilling moment in my career artistic life than to be witness to that uh, because it pulled together my life as a 
per member of the LGBTQ plus uh, community and uh, my political life, uh, such as it is, and my artistic life. And it was, it was an absolutely remarkable thing. And it, after one of the performances, uh, the story you referenced, after one of the performances that week in San Francisco, a young woman uh, came to our director, Noah Himmelstein, and uh, she might have been 20, 21, and she said that she was so um, swept away by the piece and realized that she, there was a community, there was a home for her. And uh, called her parents and came out to her parents. And uh, that just feels very big to me because uh, it was very big to her. And it, when art... Um, I love making all kinds of art, as we talked about earlier, and it's lovely when people are just have a good laugh. Um, but this is not only that. Uh, this is something else. And uh, it inspired this young woman to take a step in her life, and I hope that she's doing well now. Here we are, 11 years later. That's a really remarkable story. How, how much of that was serendipity with the timing of the performance, and how much of that was sort of politically-minded programming? Oh, uh, well, it was serendipity. That there was absolutely no, um, nobody knew what day. You never know when those Supreme Court decisions are going to be handed out. June is when they, uh, when they uh, announce them. But other than that, you don't know which day, which, which announcement's going to be. And um, it was, we, we, we've had several experiences over the years uh, where we we have looked at each other, we being me, Noah Emelstein, and our producer, Bruce Cohen. Uh, and uh, Bruce was actually on the steps. Bruce was part of the Prop 8 case. He had, the Prop 8 case was a case that was pulled together by a number of people, John August and uh, Dustin Lance Black and um, Rob Reiner and his wife and uh, Bruce Cohen and a number of others. And uh, so Bruce was on the steps of the Supreme Court that morning and got on a plane and flew to our premiere in San Francisco that night. Um, and it was absolute serendipity. And we, all, we always say, Bruce, Noah, and I, uh, that, you know, it's Harvey was, it's Harvey, like Harvey was watching and had something to do with that. Like that's, that's supernatural to me that, that things like that happen. Because something happened two years later when we did the piece, uh, oh goodness, now I'm going to forget some of the timing, but there was another June when some other major thing happened um, and uh, we were doing the show at the same time and um, it's just, you know, I, I fervently believe in uh, connection with the spiritual world, so I, I do think Harvey's keeping an eye on us. With a story like that, it's very difficult not to believe in that, I think. Um, and Dustin Lance Black, you mentioned, of course, um, who created the film, Correct. which uh, sort of you mentioned was a gateway for you. The film is a gateway for so many people. Uh, Bruce Cohen was the produ co-producer of that film. And uh, Bruce co-produced Big Fish as well. So uh, Bruce and I have had a long association professionally. And um, that, that film... Uh, people, you know, I think gay people, not just uh, everyone else, uh, gay people had heard of Harvey Milk and knew that he had been in an elected office in San Francisco and that, that, and that he had been assassinated. That was about it, though. I, I don't think, I, I didn't, I certainly didn't know much more about Harvey Milk until I saw that film. And um, that film was... Uh, transformative for a lot of people. And, and it also taught me when I got the opportunity to write about Harvey Milk, I knew immediately I didn't want to write a traditionally narrative biography. Um, not that there's anything traditional about the movie Milk, but I didn't want to write a, a chronological biography, although that one skips around time a little bit too. Um, and um, I wasn't, uh, I was very clear that it wasn't gonna be biography, in part because the film had done it so exquisitely, I had nothing to add. Sometimes you see people turning musicals, um, turning like perfect films into a musical, and I often wonder why, because I'm like, what, what about the songs is gonna make this any better? And um, that's not, I'm try, not trying to be snotty about other people's work, it's just part of my process about thinking what I want to write. And so for me, when I came across 
doing I'm Harvey Milk, it, I immediately thought non-chronological. Let, let's, let's just mix it all up. In part because the, the movie Milk had done so much heavy lifting of getting into the consciousness of, of our audience, like some of the details of Harvey's life. Have you had a chance to hear them sing the score yet? I don't know uh, where we are in rehearsals. I have, uh, yes, I heard, well, I heard Joel Harper Jackson uh, this morning sing one song and he's just so spectacular. And uh, I heard the, the men's chorus uh, today. I had worked with them a little bit and it just phenomenal. They pulled together an incredible group. And um, uh, Sierra Bogas, Sierra, so six months before we did the premiere in San Francisco, I pulled together a little um, uh, workshop in New York City. Um, and I played Harvey Milk in that workshop as a, uh, just to, as a, an experiment, just sort of see, like, I, I was, you know, the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus had suggested it, and I was like, okay, well, let's test it out and see if, if I take to this, and if people don't think it's strange that I'm playing the role that I also wrote. And Sierra was the soprano, and, and so she did it in that little three-day thing that we did in New York City, and then... Uh, I don't remember the reason, but Laura Benanti did it uh, beautifully uh, when we premiered it. I don't know, the Sierra might not have been available. And um, so all these years later, when we started putting this together, I suggested that we ask if we see if Sierra was available because she ha was the first one who ever sang the song. So I haven't heard her this week, but I heard her sing them uh, all those years ago, and she uh, still sings as beautiful as ever, beautifully as ever. And... Um, She's, you know, I know beloved by London audiences. My, one of my all-time favorite YouTube, uh, besides your, uh, your channel, of course, uh, Sierra's singing I Have Confidence at the Proms and uh, also being reminded what an extraordinary song that is. The first half of that song is all recitative and, um, and how magnificent she is. And I know she's a frequent uh, performer at the proms and has done many things in London. So I can't wait to see her. Well, the, the show is taking place this Sunday at Cadogan Hall. I am Harvey Milk. Um, and there are two performances. Two performances, 2.30 and 6.30, or half two, half six, however you say it here. And uh, the 2.30 is being hosted and a... Uh, um, the little, there's a little speech at the beginning by Vanessa Williams, who is a... a um, a friend and a colleague, she and I have worked together a little bit, and uh, Rob Houchin, our producer, uh, has worked with her uh, as an actor. And uh, then Alex Jennings at 6.30, and uh, I'm a huge fan of his, having seen him in multiple things. Uh, most recently, um, A Very Royal Scandal. I think that was the one about uh, Prince Andrew on uh, Amazon Prime. So I'm uh, really excited about both of them uh, hosting the evenings as well. Yeah. That will be, but that's also reason enough to buy tickets. Vanessa, of course, is about to open here in The Devil Wears Prada. Uh, she did City of Angels with Rob in... That's the show, that's right, City of Angels, before the pandemic shut it down, right? March of... I had tickets the week after. She's, uh, yeah, they think they start Prada tonight. I think tonight's the Wednesday, the first preview, I, I think. think. right. Yes. So that's exciting. Yes, yes. I have one final... This has just come to mind because we spoke about Vanessa, uh, who, of course, has done a lot of theatre a lot of television. Um, my, one of my favorite pieces of fairly recent Andrew Lipper trivia is Terry Hatcher of Desperate Housewives played Morticia in a regional US production of The Addams Family. And this is someone who has sort of the scope if she wanted to do Broadway, like producers would have that conversation. I, it just fascinated me that this was happening for a fairly brief engagement. Was it in California somewhere? Or? It was somewhere in California, Thousand Oaks maybe, which is a, you know, a part, yeah. you know, greater LA. I, you know, I'm very fortunate about the Adams Family. We get enormous number of productions a year and, um, and the licensing company handles all of that. So I never, if it's not a, a West End or Broadway revival, you know, if it's not that size of production, I don't know about them. And um, this was one I did not know about. I saw it on, you know, it showed up on a website or, so, or playbill.com or something. And, uh, and then I did a little research and I was like, no, it's not 
Yes, it is. And so, and, uh, and I, I don't, you know, I didn't have an opportunity to go see it. It only ran for a very short time. And, and if, uh, Terry, if you're watching, I hope you had a great time. And, uh, and if you want to do it again, call, call me. Yeah. I'm sure she was great. Yeah, she must have been. I, I'm, she's a fantastic actor. I don't know what she sings like, but I'm sure she was great. And uh, she, you know, look, you know, she, she looks like she could be Morticia. And uh, so... It's just, it's delightful. And, uh, and I'm seeing, uh, oh, I'm seeing Face in the Crowd tonight, and I'm going to see Ramin uh, Karamloo, who yeah. uh, did Gomez when we uh, did it here at the Palladium in February. So um, that's uh, another fun connection, you know, from the Adams family. Well, I hope you enjoy the rest of your time in London. I hope you enjoy Sunday very much, and I'm sure the audiences will as well. Thanks so much for having me on your show. Amazing. Thank you for talking to me. Thank you so much for watching this interview. I hope that you enjoyed. And thank you so much to the I Am Harvey Milk team and to Andrew Lipper for taking the time to share those stories and those insights with us. Make sure to comment down below with any suggestions on who you would like me to chat to next. Make sure you're subscribed and make sure you get your tickets to go and see I Am Harvey Milk at Cadogan Hall this Sunday, the 27th of October. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For ten more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey, thanks for watching, have a stagey day. Subscribe! <laughs>